why is it that when we throw exceptions on ASP.NET Core routes that it doesn't crash the entire web server? How is that possible? Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, we're going to talk more about exception handling, try catches, and middleware that we can have in ASP.NET Core. So why is it that the server does not crash when we have an exception on a route in ASP.NET Core? And that's simply because it would be bad design if the entire server came down because one web request came in and it couldn't be handled properly. But what if you wanted to do more with that? What if you wanted more control when there were exceptions thrown on your routes and you wanted to be able to do something with that information? In this video, we're going to walk through error handling middleware in ASP.NET Core and check out what we can do with that. If you find this kind of content interesting, remember to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and check out some middleware. On my screen, I have the basic weather application that we get set up in Visual Studio when we go create a new ASP.NET Core app, but I've gone ahead and started modifying it a little bit. For this demonstration, what I want to do is set up some of the default JSON options, and this is just to clean up some of the responses that we're going to be working with. So I just wanted to mention it very briefly, but I'm going to make sure that when we're writing null values out in JSON as responses, that we're not going to write those values out to the caller. That way we don't have JSON properties that are basically the property name set to null. We're just going to omit those completely. And then something else I'm doing here, and this is going to be a bit of the theme in the example that I'm walking through today, is that if we're debugging or we're sort of in this safe environment, we may want to make this more readable. So in debug mode, I'm saying, hey, I'm going to be a human consuming this information. I want to write it indented. I don't, I don't care if that's like extra, you know, space or size in the payload. I want to be able to read it. So I do want it to be indented. But, you know, if you were concerned about having more performance or having the smallest amount of payload possible, you probably don't want to have to go write indented because it's not going to offer any value to the machine that's processing it. This is just a little bit of a uh, addition that we're adding on to this example. But what we're going to do is walk through a very simple scenario to start with where we have the weather forecast route. I've hacked this to pieces, so it's no longer returning a weather forecast. We're going to start by returning a value, seeing what comes back, and then start throwing some exceptions on this route to see what we can do. Quite simply, if I go return this new object from the route, we should be able to see a JSON response that has value set to 1, 2, 3, and then something else is not going to show up because it's null. That's thanks to the JSON options. So if I go run this, it's not going to be too exciting, but this is just the baseline that we have to work with. You can see it's exactly as I said, value set to 1, 2, 3, and we don't have that other property. Now, if we go throw an exception on this route, so let's say that we have throw new invalid operation exception, something like this, right? We can put a little message in here that says, oh no. If we go run this now, what should happen is that we see this information come back on the web request, but it should not crash the entire server. So if I go do this, you can see it's loading the page and Visual Studio already is hitting this exception. So if I press F5, this will continue on. We get this page coming back, right? But you'll notice if you look at the top of my screen, Visual Studio is still running. And that means if I go to this route again, we hit the exception again, right? This isn't too exciting or, uh, you know, it's not really that interesting. But the point that I'm trying to show you here is that the whole server did not crash. And that's a very good thing in this case. If you're reflecting on times where people are saying, hey, you know, try catches, you can't just have a big try catch around stuff. In this particular case, there's a really big try catch behind the scenes, making sure that your route is not going to bring down your whole server. And to kind of prove a little bit of that, I'm throwing an invalid operation exception. But if I throw, say, a new uh, file not found exception, right? Totally random example. Right, so we don't have this one anymore. We have this one instead. Again, there's not a big list of try catch that has all of the possible exceptions that could be thrown here. The server is still running. If I press F5, it hits this again. Before we move on, this is just a quick reminder that I do have a course on C-sharp refactoring available on Dome Train. Refactoring is one of the most critical skills that you can learn as a software engineer, and this helps you continue to build upon applications that already exist, making sure that they can scale and have extensibility. I walk you through a bunch of various techniques and give you some examples that we walk through together to see how we can apply these techniques to refactor the code. Check out the pinned comment and the links in the description to get this course. Now back to the video. The reason that I was putting this video together is that in my own personal development, I wanted to make sure that my web request that I was writing had a very consistent way to handle error responses. And that means that instead of having that error page that comes up, 
I don't want to have to deal with that because a lot of the time when I'm debugging, I'm not seeing the stuff in the browser. I'm writing client side code that's calling my web server and I'm getting a JSON response back and I want to have debug information. So what we're going to do now is introduce the error handling middleware and then we can see how we can format some of that data. So in my particular case, I have debug information available to me and then I'm going to elaborate on why you may not always want to do that because it is a bit of a security risk. So to start things off, we're going to add this use exception handler call onto our app. So we can have that right at the beginning here, use exception handler. And then we say uh, this value coming in here is an I application builder. That's what the value of X is. And then we say X run, and then we need to give it an error handler. All that I've done is to find an error handler method below. If we have a look at the error handler method, we can see that it needs to meet this particular delegate syntax here. So it is going to be asynchronous. So it needs to return a task. We can give it a name that we want to have, and then it takes in an HTTP context. What I do from there, so this is the very basic thing that you need to do, but from there, because I want to work with the exception information, I have to ask the context for the list of features, and then I try to get the I exception handler path feature. This is going to be the feature that tells us what exception was thrown when our route was hit. So I pull that error right off of the exception feature here on line 50. And then from there, we can do anything we want with it, right? So from this point on in the video, this is where I'm telling you, this is how you set it up but you can decide what you want to go do with this information. What I'm going to do in my particular case is look at structuring different return values based on the exception types that we have. However, you may want to do other things in your case. I'm gonna walk through the rest of this method so you can see how it works, we'll run it, and then I'll explain why this is helpful compared to trying to do something else across all of your different routes and your application. The next part that we see here at the end of this method is that I'm setting a response status code here, so I'm setting it to 400, and then I'm writing back a new JSON object here, so I'm sort of intercepting what we're able to return back to the caller, and I made this new API response object type here. You can see that I'm passing in a null and then a new piece of information on the end of this, which is just gonna be an object with a message. So to see what that looks like, if I go to here, we can see that there's a data and error uh, parameter that get passed into this record, and then it has a success property as well. This is a perfect scenario for a NuGet package called one of, because we don't have discriminated unions inside of C-sharp. But the way that this would work is that we go to return a value, and either you get something that has data or you get something that has error. So I can't easily go enforce the data and error only being set. There's ways that you could always kind of manipulate this and it's a bit clunky to work with. The way that I would personally want to do this is use something like one of, maybe in the future we'll get this kind of language feature in C Sharp, but I'm gonna gloss over that for now because doing this in this particular way especially with the JSON serialization options we saw at the beginning, it means that if I don't set one of these, we're only going to see the other in the response. It does mean that I could go mess this up and I could go put something else right here. I could go put a new object of some type. So there's nothing stopping me from coding this right now. I could go change the API to that uh, new type and we could make that in force, but I'm just gonna, like I said, skim over that so we can see how this all works. Again, in your own development, you may wanna go clean this type of thing up more, but my goal is to have a more uniform response type that I can send back, especially in the error case. So we have this API response object. This is going to get written back as JSON. And now if we go run this, we can go see that we'll have a different result that comes back in the browser. So we get our exception being thrown. When I press F5, you can see that we get this all broken out. So there is an error, which is what we would expect in this case. It has a message that we can format. And then the success property is set to false. You don't see the other data or payload property here. There's nothing else to look at. And the reason that I wanted to be able to do something like this in my own development is again, because I'm writing a client API call to hit the server. And when a JSON response comes back, I want to make sure I can understand what the heck is going on. And you might say, well, Nick, you can't really tell that from this message. And that's exactly right. This is a very generic one. So before I go into the more specific one, I wanted to explain to you the challenge that you end up having if you try to go do this handling not in middleware. What I mean by that is if we go take this weather forecast example, what I'm going to do is introduce this other code 
that is going to be for validation. And this is a more typical thing I would say that I find that I'm writing. So I want to go do some validation. You might be using something like Fluent Validator to go write really easy to understand validation logic and then return that information back to the user. What I'm doing here is I'm throwing a brand new type of exception that I've written. We'll see this more in a moment. But the challenge that I was talking about is that instead of doing this kind of thing and saying, well, I'm going to go throw this exception. Remember, we're going to pretend that middleware is not there. What you would need to be able to do is instead of throwing the exception, you would need to do something like wrap this whole thing up in that API response. So you'd have to go return new API response. And then you would give it the information so we don't have data. And then we would have to go pass in this error object. How are we supposed to format this, right? It's inconsistent. I should have mentioned too that this object type, I probably want to have a more concrete type rather than just object. But maybe you want to go do something like this. Now we have this weird situation that I'm about to demonstrate to you that if we go copy and paste this, right? So we have another route. It's not weather forecast. It's do something else. Now, if I have validation errors that I want to send back, I need to make sure that I'm formatting this in the exact same way. This is a very contrived example because I'm not actually doing the validation properly. You can see I'm just saying missing ID for X. I'm kind of simulating this behavior. But if you keep having other routes and you keep having other types of validation logic and validation exceptions, and you want to return stuff in a consistent way, now you keep spreading this logic out further and further and further across your application, and it starts to become very messy. So the error handling middleware is a great way to work around this. I'm going to go ahead and remove this one again, and we're going to go back to this basic example here, and I'm going to go back to throwing this exception as well. So we will throw a new exception here. I'm going to throw this exception once again, and this way we can go back to having the middleware and seeing how we can handle this consistently. What I'm able to do in the middleware is add special handling so I can check the error type that's coming in. And if it's a validation exception, I can go do something more specifically here. Usually when I'm starting out in my applications, my setup like this might start looking something exactly like you see here where I'm doing specific type checking. However, this is not something that I like to propagate as my application grows. This is an example of where I like to do something that is plugin style. And that way I can keep adding different handlers for different exception types. And I don't have this big if else. I basically have a collection I can walk through to see who can handle this. But in this very simple application, that would be overkill. We're just going to check the type and we can see that I'm going to do the response status code again is 400. But in this particular case, I'm going to write out a more specific error type. I do have another if debug here. So if we're thinking through how I might want to be working with this in my own application, if I'm calling this from my own client in my development mode, I might want to get the stack trace passed back. I might want to know the exception type. This is extra information that I might want, but we would not want to do this in production. And the reason that you would not want to do this in production is because if you're passing back stack trace information or other information that might be a little bit private, and now you have people on the outside of your development team that are able to see some of these details, that might give them more information about how they can circumvent what's going on in your server. If people really want to get in, they'll find ways in, but this is just kind of helping them if you're giving them extra information. In this case, I'm using an if def for if debug, but there is a development mode in ASP.NET Core. There's lots of other ways that you can do this type of thing with configurations, flighting, anything you want. I'm just showing you one super quick, dirty example here. The other thing to mention is our validation exception could be built out more robustly to have information about what validation problems occurred. And that way, instead of just having a really generic message here, we could go list out all of the things on the request that came in and what was not valid about that. That way we could go write out a ton more detail. In this case, we're going to go back and check out the route. It's going to check if the request is valid or not. And if we go step into this down here, it's going to return true for valid. I'm going to say that it's always false. This is where you would have your fluent validation code. I'm kind of cheating here. If we go run this though, it should go throw this validation exception. And then what we should have happen is that it's going to go into this error handler and specifically this part here on line 48 and beyond. So we should get a more detailed error response coming back. There's the exception being thrown. And as you can see, it's kind of spread across my screen here, but we do get this API response object coming back. 
error is still set. We do have this message populated here. This is the exception message specifically. So like I said, if we built out more uh, of a robust validation exception, we could go add in extra properties here. Because it's in debug mode, we get these extra two properties populated. We get the exception type and we get the stack trace. And you might want to add in other details that would help you in debugging. Again, this is important for me in my development because I'm not seeing this directly in a browser. I'm seeing this in an HTTP client making a request to a server to get an API response back. And I wanted to have extra information like this because that error page that we saw at the beginning is not going to help me in my particular case. Now to go round out the rest of this video, I just want to touch on a couple more points because I did live stream putting this video together and I wanted to make sure that I touched on some things that came up because I think they're important because people were expressing their opinions about them. The first thing that I want to mention is that this thing that I'm doing where I'm making this API response type, we scroll down a little bit more, this thing right here could be very well handled by one of, which is a NuGet package. So I do recommend that if you're trying to build out something like this, one of really helps. And that way you don't have this weird situation where you're passing in a null and the other type or flipping them around or having to come up with your own version of one of. In my own development, I do have my own version of that that I've kind of customized to my liking, but this is gonna try to give you that behavior of having one or another type. We don't really have that in C Sharp as a first class thing in the language. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that you'll notice if I go back to the route, here I'm not returning that consistently. I want my API response in the error situation which is handled by that middleware to return that API response object, but I'm kind of cheating and I'm not doing that here. So in a future video and a live stream that I will put together, I'm gonna to see how we can go write middleware that's going to take any object that we return back from here and make sure that it's passed back as an API response type. So if you're interested in seeing that when it's ready, you can go ahead and check that out here. Thanks and I'll see you next time.